Hi, I'm John Stevenson. We're going to be looking at oaths and signs in our continuing study of Old Testament theology. The first kind of sign that we want to look at is what was called a sprinkling ceremony. We see this in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 8, where Moses has just given the law to the people, and now we read that he took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. That is, um, remember that the the old way to make a covenant, you would kill the animals and then everyone would pass through the pieces, uh, everyone who was being a part of that, that covenant. But in this case, we're talking about an entire nation. We're talking about uh, a, a great multitude of people. Um, it just wasn't practical to have them pass between pieces. And so what happens is the pieces come to them. The, the blood comes to them. He, uh, Moses takes the blood. He sprinkles it uh, to indicate that they have come under the blood of the covenant, that the, the oath of the covenant is now placed upon them. Um, they have been identified with the death of the animal or animals uh, that have died, uh, again, to take that potential either blessing if they keep the covenant or cursing if they break the covenant, but to take that upon themselves. Next, we have the offering of a sacrifice. And for here, uh, we're going to look at Psalm chapter 50, verses 4 and 5. Uh, we read, He summons the heavens above and the earth to judge his people. Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Notice that, that a sacrifice is involved. Um, that's how you get the, the blood for the sprinkling ceremony that we just talked about. Uh, you, you take an animal and it is put to death. Uh, it is sacrificed. And then uh, from that animal comes this high idea of the covenant. Next, we have the idea of passing under the rod. This is referenced in, in Leviticus, but also is referenced here in Ezekiel chapter 20, beginning verse 37, where God says, I will make you pass under the rod. Now, that's shepherd language. Um, a shepherd would take his sheep, and as they are perhaps uh, going into the fold, uh, that's one place where it could happen. Uh, he he has the rod over top of them, <clears throat> and he's he's using this to to just sort of count them. He's not striking them, but he's, he's maybe tapping them uh, as they move in. Uh, one, two, three, four, and and then every tenth. Uh, okay, now we've got ten, and and we're going to 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 go in mul multiples of ten um, as he counts the sheep, and of course he he can use this. <clears throat> to examine the sheep, uh, make sure they're really sheep, <laughs> make sure there's no <clears throat> there's no wolves that are there or that there's no goats that are being counted. Remember how Jesus talks about separating between the sheep and the goats. And so it can have the reference to judgment, uh, but it doesn't have to. It can just be this idea uh, where uh, you're, if you're under the rod, you belong to the shepherd. And that's really the idea there. You're under his authority. And so our passage says, I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Notice how that, that's, that authority there is seen by the rod. And I will purge from you the rebels and those who transgress against me. That's the judgment part that can be there uh, passing under the rod. All of those ideas can be combined. Next, we have the idea of a verbal oath. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 speaks of this, that when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. When you entered into an oath, an oath is not just a promise. An oath, what you would do with an oath, you would swear by something. And you would say, if my word is not true, or if it does not come true, then the thing by which I swore, may that be destroyed. So that if you you know if you swore by the temple, you were saying, "May the temple be destroyed if if my word is not true." And of course, that would be a, a great tragedy. Uh, notice here in Hebrews, God says He could swear by nothing greater. He wanted to make the highest possible oath, and so what did He do? He swore by Himself. He swore by God. May God cease to exist if this word does not come true. That's that's a very strong oath. Another sign we have in the eating of a meal, and we have this uh, several places where this takes place. Genesis chapter 31 is the instance where Jacob has 
uh, left the presence of Laban. He is headed back home, but Laban rushed to catch up with him, and it was touch and go whether it was going to be a friendly meeting or an unfriendly meeting. Was it going to be a good thing or a, or a tragedy? Uh, and at the end of the day, they agree. Um, they agree that they're going to separate and, and be apart, but it's, it's going to be a, a peaceful separation. And we read in Genesis thirty one fifty four. then Jacob offered a sacrifice on the mountain. So notice we've already talked about offering a sacrifice. That's, that's part of this covenant that's, that's taking place. And called his kinsmen to the meal. And they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. So not only do they offer a sacrifice, but a meal is offered, a meal of reconciliation, uh, a meal that shows that they are bound together in this covenant relationship. We see the same thing in Exodus chapter 24. This is after the law has been given. The, the, the stipul- you, know, you had the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and then chapters 21 uh, to 23, you have the stipulations. Uh, the, uh, I call them the what about this, what about that when it comes to the law, uh, the further explanation. And then we read that Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, those are the sons of Aaron, and 70 of the elders of Israel. So you have all the leaders of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and here it is, and they ate and drank. They ate a meal with the Lord. (laughs) And this eating of this meal, uh, it, it showed that they were at peace, that they had entered into this covenant relationship, and now they partake of a meal together, uh, a meal of fellowship, a meal that binds them together. Next, we have the granting of a gift. An example of this is in Genesis chapter 21, verse 29, where, where Abimelech, uh, this, this early uh, Philistine ruler, uh, he and Abraham have had uh, some issues. Uh, the issues revolved around uh, water rights and the use of a well. And Abimelech said to Abraham, what do these seven ewe lambs mean, which you've set by themselves? What he's, he, he brings a gift of these seven lambs. And he said, you shall take these seven ewe lambs from my hand so that it may be a witness to me that I dug this well. This is going to be a sign that this belongs to me, and uh, it's, it's signed by the gift of these lambs. So notice how the granting of a gift can be a sign. Verse uh, Genesis 31, this is going back to the, the Jacob and Laban story, where they make a covenant, and this time it's not just the eat of a, eating of a meal, although there is that. It's not just the sacrifice, although there is that. But it is a memorial stone that I want to, to, to focus on, uh, where you see in verse 44, Now come, let us make a covenant, you and I, and let it be a witness between you and me. And as a sign of that covenant, then Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. This would become a memorial stone to show that uh, uh, the covenant was in force that they had made. Of course, they've already gone through the covenant ceremony. They've, they've done the sacrifice. They've taken oaths. They've eaten the meal. Uh, but now a stone is set up as a perpetual reminder. Verse 46, Jacob said to his kinsmen, gather stones. So they took stones and made a heap and they ate there by the heap. So notice the, the, the eating and the stones, it's, it's all interrelated. Now, when we look at the covenant, we already started with the Noahic covenant, and we said there that the sign of the covenant was the rainbow. Uh, a bow, which, remember, that was a military weapon, very advanced military weapon for its day, the most advanced military weapon you could have. Uh, you could kill somebody long distance, and God set the bow up in the sky where everyone could see it, uh, and it, it signified that God had he had holstered his weapon. He had set his weapon on the mantle, as it were. Uh, he had taken his weapon and hung it up in the sky, no longer to be used against people. Somebody pointed this out. It's actually pointed not toward mankind. It's pointed up to the sky. It's pointed against God. And God's saying, uh, I'm not going to break my part of this covenant. Next, you have the Abrahamic covenant. We have already seen this. Uh, the sign of the covenant was circumcision, a very private sign, not, not put out in public, uh, a sign that, that's connected to the seed. That is, uh, it is a sign 
that is connected to the uh, giving um, of children and fruitfulness and those things that are part of the promises of this covenant. Now, circumcision was a sign of faith. Romans chapter 4, verse 11 mentions that. And you say, well, how could it be a sign of faith when there were infants, eight days old, that were being circumcised? It was a faith into which they would be brought up. Uh, Abraham believed it was counted to him for righteousness, and so he was able to take the sign of faith upon himself. But the sign was also going to be passed down from father to son, not to wait until they're a a certain age of accountability or anything like that, but rather uh, at the age, uh, at a very young age, eight days old, uh, they were to be marked uh, with this sign. And it was a marking to say, um, they're going to have faith, they don't have it yet. But I'm going to bring up this child in the faith. I'm going to bring up this child so that eventually what is true on the outside of his circumcision will also be true on the inside where he will receive a circumcised heart as well. Now we've come to the Mosaic Covenant and the sign. Covenant, the sign of the Mosaic Covenant here in Exodus chapter 31, verse 13. You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. The Sabbath was given as a sign, and notice that you will observe my Sabbaths in the plural. So the Sabbath day, but not just the day, because remember there was also a sabbatical year and there was a, uh, a, 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 a year of jubilee. There was a whole series of Sabbaths. So I would take that to be all of the above, although beginning, the foundational one, was the one day in seven, the, the Sabbath day. And that was to become a sign of the covenant. A sign, God says, that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, the question comes up, why don't uh, Christians today observe the seventh day? Why are they observing the first day of the week? Why do they worship on the first day of the week? Uh, And, of course, the answer is because Jesus did something that brought about a new sanctification, a new holiness, a more complete sanctification, and he did so on the first day of the week. And from very early, in the, from New Testament era, era on, it became the standard practice. I don't know if it was universal, but it was the standard practice among Christians, beginning in the book of Acts, you see it already there, and, and referenced in the epistles, where on the first day of the week, they would meet together, and, and this became their meeting time to commemorate Really not the, the, the first day of the week, but the eighth day, the, the day after that, uh, the, the permanent rest. You know how Hebrews tells us uh, Moses gave them a rest, but it wasn't permanent. It always had to be repeated. But we have entered into a more permanent rest because what Jesus accomplished doesn't need to be done every week. Jesus died upon the cross, and we don't need another sacrifice. We don't need something new to take its place. It doesn't need to be renewed. It's a once and for all sacrifice on our behalf. So we've seen the the Mosaic Covenant with, with the Sabbath, but now we come to the New Covenant. And what is the sign of the New Covenant? And when we ask that question, two things come to mind? Uh, the Is it baptism? Is it the Lord's Supper? Is it in some sense both? Now, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus when he said, uh, this evil, evil and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but no sign will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Uh, three days and three nights, and then a resurrection. So, in a sense, the resurrection is our sign, but both of these Both baptism and the Lord's Supper both point to the death and the burial and the resurrection. So there's a sense in which we have not one, but two signs. We have uh, baptism, which is a one-time event. Now, I know people who have been baptized and and they felt like, gee, that didn't really take, so I need to go be baptized again. Uh, I remember I had a friend who uh, wanted to be baptized in the Jordan River, and I asked him, I said, well, haven't you already been baptized? And he said, yeah, but I, I want to do it again. I said, well, okay, well, uh, you know, it's, um, there's really one baptism in the scriptures. Um, um, and so it's not that you be baptized and then you be baptized again. It's a one-time event because Jesus died 
one time. And yet when we come to the Lord's Supper, you don't do that just one time. That is a repeated event where you take the Lord's Supper and then perhaps at a later date, in fact, I would think on a fairly regular basis, you ought to be partaking of the Lord's Supper as it depicts your continuing feeding upon the gospel. You see, baptism is the rite or ritual of initiation. Now you say, well, does that mean uh, you have to be of a certain age to be baptized? And I would ask, well, how old did you have to be to be initiated into the Old Covenant? Uh, did you have to, uh, because the Old Covenant, uh, remember the, 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 the sign of the Mosaic Law was the, the ritual of circumcision. And that was a sign of faith. And baptism is a sign of faith. But does that mean you need to be of a certain age? Or is that r- ritual promissory, looking back at what Christ accomplished, but also ahead to how we are cleansed and will continue to be cleansed by what he accomplished on our behalf? Now, uh, baptism is a, is a rite of initiation, but the Lord's Supper is a rite of participation. That is, as you eat and drink, you are, you are outwardly doing that thing that pictures the inward taking in of faith. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul actually warns against those who might be partaking of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. That is, in not ascribing to it its worthiness, those that might not understand or aren't really thinking about what they're doing, that it ought to be done uh, with the realization of what is taking place. And so I would argue against, and I know some people don't feel this way, but I would argue against partaking of the Lord's Supper if you're not yet a believer, if you don't really understand what's going on. Um, And so I would argue against, for example, infants taking the Lord's Supper because um, it's it's not something they're going to get right now. Uh, It's a rite of participation, a repeated event to be sure, but something in which they are outwardly engaging in the action that should be mirrored within as they are eating and drinking of Jesus, as they are trusting in him. Baptism, then, has its counterpart in circumcision, whereas I would suggest that the Lord's Supper has its counterpart in Passover. Remember that the the Lord's Supper was initiated at a Passover. Uh, and and for sure, there were children there that, that, were, uh, that would be asking, uh, what does this mean? And they would be told what it means uh, so that they could understand as they ate, as they partook of that supper. Um, and so I think, I think a, a little child can hear and understand the gospel. And understanding the gospel, um, in, in most churches, uh, they would perhaps be examined by the elders as to the veracity of their faith, and then partake, uh, not just in baptism, which, which they, that might have happened when they were much younger, um, maybe even as infants, but in the Lord's Supper, they would now be partaking of that in a knowing and um, in a state in which they were aware of what they were doing. 